This meeting is being recorded. Oh, that's new. I haven't heard that voice before. So yeah, that was new. <laughs> well, uh, again, thank you guys for being here. I really appreciate it. Uh, I, you know, we had hoped to come together uh, in person today. That was the plan for the last couple of weeks, and uh, Rona kind of got in the way. So uh, we'll give this we'll give this a couple of weeks and see how it shakes out. Hopefully, this thing passes through uh, the neighborhood, and we can uh, we can all get on with it. Um, but uh, but I did want to share with you some really really important updates um, with respect to the rain forms. Uh, you know, as you know, the rain forms update probably every six months. Uh, it seems like, and uh, and whenever they do that, of course, uh, it's our responsibility as realtors to be familiar with those changes so that we don't get our clients into a situation that, you know, they'd rather not be in, uh, and certainly not because we didn't explain it to them properly. So. So that's the idea. Um, I've got uh, I've got all the, the changes uh, pulled up, and I'll, I'll share my screen here with you guys, and we'll just kind of run through them real quick, uh, and then I will email you uh, several attachments so that you have a more tangible copy. Uh, but I'm also going to show you exactly where you can find them uh, on the Rain website right here, right now, uh, and then the um, um, the Rain Broker Symposium. Uh, meeting was recorded. And so it's about 40 minutes long, I think. Uh, and I watched it last week and they did a really good job of going through these changes in more detail than we will actually cover today. Uh, and so we won't, uh, we won't be in here too long, uh, but I do want to give you an idea of some things to look for. Uh, and then of course, show you where you can find more information going forward. So that's uh, that's my plan. Anybody uh, got any shout outs or uh, hallelujahs before we jump into a screen share? Well, hallelujah. <laughs> so, I said taxes. <laughs> taxes. <laughs> Awards. Uh, <laughs> all right. Let me uh, let me share my screen here. Uh, let's see if I can find my uh, email. Let's go here. Hopefully. Okay. You guys see the screen? My email? Yes, yes. Okay, cool. So uh, December 27th, you should have all received this. Um, so go back and look for it uh, in your email if you didn't pay attention to it, like uh, most of us don't. Uh, a lot of the stuff they send us is not necessarily critical to our day to day. Uh, but every once in a while, they put some good stuff in there. And so I always like to take a peek at it. Uh, and uh, on December 27th, they sent out this, uh, which was the uh, recorded broker symposium. So you can click here to go to the video and watch the, the recorded uh, in detail transcript. Um, or you can click this link right here, which is what we'll do today. Uh, and this should take us into our uh, RAIN resale and rental form updates screen. So do you guys see this screen? Yes. Yes, yes. Okay. All right. Cool. So, uh, so this form, this screen is available. If you just go to your log, regular rain login and then go to contracts and forms. And then right underneath that is the resale and rental form updates so that you can find this, uh, on your own afterwards. Um, and so there weren't a lot of changes to the standard purchase agreement. Fortunately, um, paragraph 11, uh, which is, is kind of interesting. The only change they made uh, was they added back the blank line that they had previously taken out because they thought it was confusing. Well, the lenders thought by removing the line that that was confusing. And so they added it back in. Uh, and so I'm going to show you uh, what I'm talking about right here. So I'm going to click this and uh, see if this opens up for us. So you guys see the purchase agreement right now? Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. And so we're going to scroll down then to uh, paragraph 11, and you can see the revision date has been updated on every page. So it went from July 1st now to January 3rd as the latest revision date, uh, and they do that. And so you want to make sure that you have the most recent, most up-to-date copy available whenever you're writing uh, an offer. And of course, Stacia does a really good job of updating our templates for us. Um, so... Most of the time, we don't have to worry about that. They're, they're autom automatically being updated. Um, I'm working on so them today. You're doing it today. <laughs> okay. Right now as we speak. Here is paragraph 11. 
So paragraph 11 is the paragraph that talks about, you know, the appraisal, uh, whether it's an FHA or VA financing, and that the buyer is not obligated to pay more than the appraised prop the appraised value of the property. Um, and so this blue line, believe it or not, they had removed it. Um, and the reason they did that is because they said that, you know, while it was very commonplace for people to negotiate a contract price back and forth, all of the changes would occur on the front page or the first page of the purchase agreement. And no one would ever remember to go back to paragraph 11 and change that price to match the price on the front page of the contract. And so uh, Rain thought, you know, let's just get rid of the stupid line. We don't need it anyway. Uh, and then of course the lenders said, hey, 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 we want that line back. And so that is it. That was what they did with the purchase agreement this go around. Um, so nothing too, uh, nothing too complicated about that. Make sense? Easy peasy. Yep. Do we uh, put something on that line, Jason? No. Well, the, what you're going to put on this line is the agreed upon purchase price. Purchase price. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So whatever, whenever the negotiations end, then that's the price that you'll put on this line. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So. All right, cool. Let me, uh, whoops, let me move this out of the way and go up here and close this. All right. And so uh, standard new construction residential purchase agreement. Um, again, it's this very exact same change. So we're not going to take a look at that. Um, we don't have a whole lot of new construction purchase agreement contracts here. Uh, this one's specifically for North Carolina. Um, standard listing agreement. And so this one, this one actually caught us off guard uh, recently. And so let me let me click this to show you guys. So it used to be that we had up to two days to get the listings into rain from the day that this paperwork was signed. Um, but now we don't. Now we have until the next business day. So uh, this one, this one, uh, you got to know that when you're going to list a property. Uh, that we've only got literally the next business day to get that entered. Otherwise, rain will snag it and they will cry about it and they will send us a nasty gram. Uh, and uh, they might even ask you to pay them a hundred bucks. Uh, uh, can I talk about that? Yeah, please. So as an example, what they mean is if you get a listing and you date it for, I'm going to use today's date, January 4th, I have to have all that paperwork in the system by tomorrow. No ifs, ands, or buts. It has to be in the system by tomorrow. Also, when you get a listing sign, um, yeah. you can get it signed whenever. So you could have signed it December 31st for it to go in the system on the 4th. It still has to go in either on the 4th or the 5th. It can't, there's no like excuses. Now, if you dated it the 31st, it has to go in by the third because like the 31st was Friday, the first and second was a weekend. It can go in on the third. That makes the next business day. Just, just remember that when you're doing listings, um, check the calendar um, to make sure that you're going to be able to turn everything in by the date that it can be in. Does that make so sense? So you want us to do all the listings on a Friday? Never. <laughs> and never after 3.30. They take forever. Never um, after 3.30. <laughs> never after 3.30. Um, well, well. Yeah, no. So the, the reasoning is uh, to do, to, to look at the calendar, because sometimes when you e-sign stuff, your clients don't sign it on the exact day that you want them to. So make sure that you have enough time to get them to e-sign it and get it back in time to get it in the system so that you're not sending them another form to sign to update the, the list date. Stacia, can I ask a question, please? Sure. <coughs> okay, so a lot of times I will do, as you know, um, because, because we have so many offers that we have to write now, we never know when one's, and I, I know this is stand listing, uh, but I don't always do the, the Long and Foster forms right up front. I might do all the RAIN forms that you need, and then, and then I'll send a separate email with the Long and Foster forms. So is that acceptable still to you? 
For sales contracts, yes, that's perfectly fine. On a okay. listing agreement, you wouldn't have that. Yeah, yeah, okay. But on a sales contract, you can certainly do two separate emails, Long and Foster okay. forms in one, and then all of the forms that go to the listing side um, in okay. a separate one. I prefer yeah. two attachments than 35, but if I get 35, I'll upload <laughs> them all. And then Jason gets to open each individual one. So it's, um, <laughs> it's yeah. <laughs> doesn't really matter how I get them as long as I get them. Okay, just double checking. Thank you. Mm -hmm. cool. Any other clarification or questions on this Nita? Moving on. <laughs> All right, so summary of rights and obligations. This is kind of a big deal. Um, item nine, special flood hazard areas. Updated language to align with the updates in the Virginia code. And so uh, let's click on that and see what that looks like. So summary of rights and obligations. And we're gonna go down, we're looking for our red line edit. Uh, and you can see in paragraph nine here, special flood hazard areas. Uh, they've added quite a bit of language or a couple of sentences anyway, in order to better align it with the way the code was written at the state house in Virginia, uh, up in Richmond. And so, a flood risk information form that provides additional information on flood risk and flood insurance is available for download by the real estate board on its website. Uh, and so I have that form available. And so I'll go ahead and send that to you guys after this uh, so that you don't go have to hunt around and look for it. But, um, but it is something that's supposed to be made available to the buyer um, as part of the residential property disclosure statement summary of rights and obligations so good to know will that form be attached in our templates then there are some new pages that need to go into the templates yeah yeah okay oh. all right um the cdif um obviously you know the flood hazard areas are going to change just like they did mm -hmm. on the summary of rights uh, and then we've got a couple of other changes here that we can talk about as well. Regarding the forms he's talking about, those are usually in there already. I just have to go and replace them. Okay. Which I'm doing right now. <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh, financing and insurance, SCC Virginia, da, 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 da. looks like a website. Additional information may be obtained at a website. So keep in mind, guys, that uh, these are the disclosure forms that we present to our clients um uh, it, it kind of you know it it helps us it protects us in the event there's a problem that comes up later uh for failing to disclose when we make sure that we present these forms and get them initialed off on uh, of course there's an initial space there on each one of these and so um, in lieu of having to memorize all of these disclosures um it's just best that we get these forms signed uh, as soon as possible. So again, flood hazard areas and flood insurance. Da, 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 da. Program, flood risk information website open to the Department of Conservation and Recreation, uh, determining whether flood insurance is required in accordance with the terms and conditions as may be contained in the real estate purchase contract. But in any event, prior to settlement pursuant to such contract, a flood risk information form that provides additional information on flood insurance, flood risk and flood insurance is available for download by the real estate board. So again, I'll, I'll send that to you guys later, but you can see they, they completely replaced the previous paragraph, essentially. Something to be familiar with uh, in the event that the, most of the time our clients don't ask us about these, you know, I, I don't know how you present these disclosures, but I, kind of uh, present them as a bullet point outline. I don't, I don't necessarily read every word to them. Um, I expect that uh, they're competent to, uh, to read this themselves. So uh, historical district uh, the, uh, has been completely removed. Wow. Um, so. Yay. <laughs> so that's gone. Yeah, uh, military air installation has been updated again to better represent the code uh, as handed down by Richmond. And then we have a permissive disclosure tourism activity zone. 
Um, and so this is interesting too. There's a map that goes along with this new paragraph and this new code, uh, which identifies tourism activity zones. And so I have that map and I'll send that to you as well. Um, but it says, provides that an owner of residential property located partially or wholly within a designated tourism activity zone established pursuant to section blah, 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 may disclose in writing to any prospective purchaser or lessee of the property that the subject property is located within a tourism activity zone with a description of potential impacts associated with the parcel's location in a tourism activity zone, including impacts caused by special events, parades, temporary street closures, and indoor outdoor entertainment activities. You know, like if you live in, uh, in Hilton area of Newport News, well, they shut all those streets down when it's parade time, you know, and, uh, and I'm sure that, uh, you know, downtown Smithfield does the same thing, you know, and whether or not, whether or not your home is historic, you may live in a tourism activity zone. So that's the idea there. So Jason, the form you said you'll give us, I assume that has the list of cities or, or neighborhoods that are considered yeah, it's in got this little, zone. It's got little dots on a map. Okay. Um, actually, okay. yeah. Okay. Hmm. Um, property previously used to manufacture methamphetamines. So do we have to disclose that, Jason? Or is that what they're saying? I see it's saying a permissive. Uh, it's a permissive disclosure, so. Right, yeah, and it says the buyer may disclose, um, or the, the, the seller, rather, um, may disclose. May disclose so not in writing to any prospective purchaser or lessee of the property that the subject property is located within a tourism. Uh, it does not say must. Yeah, uh, that's what I was going to say. Okay. It's, only, it, it's only if you know. I mean, it's possible to own a home and not know whether or not you're in one of these designated tourism activity zones. Since this okay. is, after all, this is brand new. Um, so, you know, it used to be a thing to disclose whether or not you were in a historic zone. Um, and they've taken that away and replaced it with this tourism activity zone which you may or may not be aware of. Okay. Stormwater management facilities. <coughs> Code of Virginia provides that an owner of residential real property has, has actual knowledge of a privately owned stormwater management facility located on such property disclosed to the purchaser the long-term maintenance and inspection requirements for the facility. Such disclosure shall be provided to the purchaser in accordance with the chapter and on a form provided by the real estate board. And of course I have that for you as well. Um, so you guys have probably seen in your travels, these stormwater management facilities. It's like a little brick building um, that may be near or on someone's property. And, uh, and so normally there are no ongoing maintenance costs associated with that. It's usually something that's handled by the county and or city. Um, you know, some properties have those big storm drains <laughs> I've seen in the backyard. Uh, and so the city or the county will come through once in a while to clear those drains. I've never seen a situation where the homeowner or the landowner was responsible for maintaining that. Uh, it's always fallen back to the, uh, the city or the county. Um, but it is now required uh, to be disclosed if one of these facilities is located on the property to transfer and if there are any uh, maintenance fees or inspection requirements. You know, maybe they come around twice a year and you got to make sure your gate is unlocked uh, when they're coming around to do their inspections. That sort of thing will need to be disclosed by the seller uh, in advance. So I think that's uh, that's good to know. That's something that is, is brand spanking new. So I've never seen anything quite like that before. So you definitely want to be aware of that if you're in an area where uh, there's a stormwater management facility. So I have a question. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> does that that does that affect your uh, your property value? You know, I don't, I don't I don't think that it should. Although it may affect the saleability because one particular buyer may turn his nose up at it. Uh, just because it is a thing, uh, but I don't think it's going to necessarily impact the value of a property. Um, they are 
fairly common. I mean, I can think of a few that I've seen in the last couple of years. I, I don't, yeah, I, I can't imagine that it would um, anytime soon anyway, um, with the shortage of homes that we have. Uh, you know, you could do just about anything in the backyard and somebody's gonna buy it anyway. Um, I thought the city on those, the, the property that those buildings were on, I guess I didn't realize that they were actually on people's properties. And I think uh, in most cases, you're probably right. I, I don't, I, I mean, I can think of, uh, I was showing a house a few weeks ago and there was one of these concrete brick buildings, you know, in the backyard. Um, and it was a stormwater management facility. It was over in um, Hydenwood area of Newport News. Um, and, you know, while my folks didn't really care um, because it didn't look like it was going to have to be anything they were involved with, um, they would perhaps have to let the city or the workers in occasionally to do whatever it is they do in those little buildings uh, to manage the stormwater. Jason, so, a while back I sold a property that had one of those buildings um, and they actually, they would come out. My client didn't have a gate or anything. They would just go in, they had a key, go in and inside and look at it and take care of it. He didn't have to do anything and he never had a problem with it. Okay, that's, do, that's what I would expect, yeah. Do you think that the city actually paid the, the original homeowner to build that on their property? Just, just a question, just being... You know, that's a great question. I guess uh, devil's advocate. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I think now, that's a great question. Can, you know, I would think not because I know at the last house I was in, Dominion came around and they wanted to put, you know, everything underground. And we had to, the whole neighborhood had to just sign a form saying that they were okay with it. We weren't compensated, but some houses did end up with these great big old boxes in their yards that I don't think everyone was aware that they were going to have those in their yards. Mm. Um, my, I just, my driveway just got dug up a little bit and then they repaved it. But, but none of us, I don't think knew to what extent it, we were saying okay to. And we certainly weren't compensated for any of the damage that they did. Um, the digging up or the, re, or the putting the concrete back down. Um, with regards to what you just said marvella about not knowing or was it there prior to my mom mm -hmm. um the street that my parents live on used to have a um an alleyway between the two streets and they had a telephone pole back there and the telephone company didn't believe that there was a telephone pole there so it had been there since we had moved in in the early 80s, um, since before the early 80s. And I mean, they have to come in my parents' backyard all the time to mess with the telephone pole. So, I mean, it, it could have been there prior to the home being built. All right. Hmm. All right, let's, uh, let's look at this repetitive risk loss. I thought this was interesting as well. This is Brand spanking new. Um, it says the, uh, the Code of Virginia requires disclosures pertaining to the repetitive risk loss. The owner of residential real property located in the Commonwealth who has actual yeah. knowledge, those are the key words, actual knowledge that the dwelling unit is a repetitive risk loss structure shall disclose that fact to the purchaser. So uh, for the purposes of this section, repetitive risk loss means that two or more claims, more than $1,000 were paid by the National Flood Insurance Program within any rolling 10 year period since back to 1978. So such disclosure shall be provided to the purchaser on a form provided by the real estate board on its website. And I have that form for you, but um, I, I that's interesting. I mean, you may not have actual knowledge if you bought the house, you know, 10 years ago or, you know, seven years ago or what have you. You don't necessarily know the history prior to your ownership. But if you do, then the law requires that you make that disclosure uh, as a repetitive risk loss, meaning two claims, more than $1,000 were paid inside of 10-year period. Um, 
So that's definitely something new we're going to have to uh, start paying attention to and ask your seller, you know, do you have knowledge of any flood claims? Uh, more than two over a thousand dollars will require a disclosure, a separate written disclosure. I wonder, do we know where that information could come from? I wonder if Don can get that information. Go, going back to uh, 1978, for example. I mean, we only have to go back 10 years though, right? Right, yep. So I don't understand why it says 1978, but I mean, I wonder if an insurance, I mean, I wonder if that's like, if you call an insurance company on a house, they usually have a backstory on that house. Yeah, like a clue report, I think. Uh, and, and they can look up any previous year's claims. But uh, do we don't need to do that. We just need to no. ask the agent, I mean, the owner. Exactly, yeah. This is, uh, this is incumbent upon the owner or the seller uh, to disclose if they've had a repetitive risk loss or if they know that the property has been subject to repetitive risk loss. Yeah. So I think that, uh, you know, as realtors, we're insulated uh, by providing them with this information. Uh, but, you know, our job is to look out for our clients and we want to protect them as well. Uh, and so we should bring this to their attention. All right. That was a good one, right? <laughs> All right, that was the CDIF. Um, Purchase price escalation addendum. You guys are uh, probably very, very, getting very, very familiar with these. Uh, and so let's take a look at, see what they did there. So uh, you can see the red line, obviously they are replaced with the blue lines. And so they've tried to clean up the language just a little bit. Um, in the event seller elects to increase the purchase price, in the purchase agreement, pursuant to paragraph one, seller shall initial the revised purchase price as increased pursuant to the purchase price escalation addendum, right? And so we're right here, adjusting the loan amount and down payment as necessary and deliver to buyer the initial purchase agreement and a copy of the competing offer. Upon initialing the increased purchase price in the purchase agreement and accept as provided in paragraph three, and five below all other terms and conditions of the purchase agreement shall remain in full force and effect for the purchase price escalation addendum uh, shall be of no further force and effect. So it says the seller may delete, the seller may delete the personal information of the buyer contained in the competing offer, right? So when requested, the, the listing agent is supposed to send us a, a, a copy of the competing offer to prove that this is why they're going to invoke or enact uh, our purchase price escalation addendum. And so this is that they can delete the personal information of the buyer contained in the competing offer when delivering the copy of the competing offer to the buyer. The buyer shall have the right to terminate this purchase price escalation addendum and purchase agreement if buyer is not satisfied in buyer's discretion with the competing offer. So I thought that was interesting. Um, because the buyer has two days from the buyer's receipt of the copy of the competing offer to terminate this purchase agreement, whether or not they've in, engaged or invoked this purchase price escalation addendum. Um, so that was definitely different. Or such right to terminate shall be of no further force and effect and shall be deemed to have been waived. So two days, remember that. If you guys send over a purchase price escalation addendum, and they say, okay, we're gonna take this and we're going to engage or invoke your purchase price escalation addendum. And here's the price that we're going to, to take this offer. Here's our competing offer. Your buyer still has two days uh, to change their mind. Mm. I like that. <laughs> That's what I thought. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> what if, I mean, that takes the other offers off. It does, yeah. I mean, if, if, if the listing so agent- well notifies everybody that they're going to accept another offer based on the purchase price escalation addendum and then your buyer backs out and puts the listing agent in a really precarious spot because now the listing agent has to go back to any previous other other offers get a backup and, and and try to yeah try to retain one of them is that not what that's not working for our seller though that seems kind of in competition there that 
that doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. Well, yeah. you know what? If you read the, that next sentence too, it says that the seller shall execute and deliver that agree that release within three days after the seller's receipt. So you have five days there where either party, where the whole thing could fall apart. It's just hanging out in limbo. Yeah, yeah, it really doesn't make any sense at all. It's like, no, okay, we lost, we lost 15 offers, let's put it back on the market. <laughs> to terminate, the buyer shall execute and deliver a release agreement or similar termination and release within such two day period and seller shall execute and deliver such release agreement within three days of seller's receipt from buyer. So that's once the decision has been made by the buyer, right? They, the buyer has two days. Um, yeah. So the seller doesn't necessarily have two days. The buyer has two days. Um, and then of course they, it's just a matter of transferring the release from one party to the other party. Can we write in there that they only have hours? Can we mark that out and change it? The 24 hours. Um, you know, I mean, I, I think at that point you're tinkering with the code, um, the way it was written. Just I don't see, Yeah, I, I'm, I would, I would try to avoid it. I, I don't know. Uh, Sellers are not going to be happy about that. Yeah, well, uh, I, I agree. I thought it was a little bit of a surprise too. Um, so maybe we can, uh present it in such a way that it doesn't appear as disagreeable. Purchase price escalation addendum. That's a good one. And then, uh, of course, property under contract fall through report off market. Um, this is not really uh, anything. That's more us. of a form for me. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's an internal form. So, uh, well, station form. So, so that's it, guys. That's all of the changes that took effect uh, yesterday, uh, officially. And uh, they are currently being updated in our templates and uh, should have that done uh, here in the next couple of days. Finish in the up. next like 20 minutes. Um, <laughs> if, if by some chance I selected on a listing, I selected a buyer instead of a seller like CDIF or the summary of rights and obligations, just give me a heads up and I'll fix it. Because they give two different forms, uh, one so that when you upload it, it automatically pulls in the signatures uh, for the buyers or the sellers, depending on the form or the template you pick. So I think I'm right right now, but all of the sales contracts are done, so you guys should be fine with those. And I'm almost done with the listings since there were only four forms to change. Let me just, uh, we, don't, we don't spend a lot of time with rental uh, paperwork, but, uh, but we do a little. And so let's take a look at this. The uh, rental showing disclosure form has been uh, just, just modified ever so slightly. So the disclosure of agency, they added the word of agency uh, to that form. And then, um, and then down here, they added showing agent. See, it used to say just firm W9. Now it says showing agents firm. W9 will be required prior to the payment of any finder's fee. So that was uh, that was the only change that they've made on this uh, rental showing disclosure. So, okay, so that's that. So you guys know where to find this. You know where the video is, uh, where you have a bunch of attorneys uh, talking through this in a little more detail maybe than, than we've spent on it today. Um, so don't hesitate to uh, get in there and, you know, familiarize yourself. Uh, maybe if we go back and watch the video, uh, the attorney who explained it could do maybe a little better job uh, in helping us understand some of the nuances in that purchase price escalation addendum. So that might be a place to, uh, to start uh, with respect to, you know, any, any more questions uh, regarding that. Um, I also wanted to share with you guys uh, a couple of uh, emails I got this morning, which I thought were actually pretty darn interesting. So first of all, uh, if you're not familiar with this, Virginia Living Magazine is now taking votes for um, you know the best of Virginia. And so uh, if you don't have this email, 
Uh, I'm sure you can probably find it or I can send it to you, but it's through Virginia Living, right? Uh, Virginia Living Magazine. And so you have an opportunity here to click on this and select the best companies, restaurants, whatever. Um, you know, and so it would be really cool if we could get a bunch of votes for uh, Suffolk and Smithfield Long and Foster offices. And so we are uh, in the Eastern region as identified uh, by the Virginia Living Magazine. So you just have to put your email address in, you define the region that you're in, and you go through and you select as many or as few as you want. So you could just jump right to the real estate section. Uh, and it, I mean, you could be in and out of this thing in just a couple of minutes. So I thought that would be kind of neat for, uh, for us to take a look at. I think that would be fun. Um, if you need a copy of this uh, in order to find the link, I could send it to you. Um, or uh, there's the uh, Survey Monkey link. I wonder if I could put this in chat. Do you know how to do that? I don't know how to do it. Let's see, chat. And bam, did it work? Yeah. So there you go. So you guys can click on that link there and it'll take you to this voting site, I'm guessing. So. So that was cool. I thought that was really cool this morning. Um, also wanted to show you guys this because I thought this was scary as hell. Um, and it actually kind of reinforces the market that we uh, have been in and over the last year and a half. Um, I thought this was pretty, pretty, pretty interesting. Um, in 2021, rents grew dramatically. Uh, and since January of 2021, one year ago, the national median rent has increased by a staggering 17.8%. That's insane, you guys. Um, and it really makes me feel bad for the renters. Um, to put that in context, rent growth from January to November averaged just 2.6% in the pre-pandemic years from 2017 to 2019. So 2017 to 2019, we averaged 2.6% rent growth and here in the last 12 months, we rents have gone up 17.8%. That's really, really scary uh, if you are someone who's not in a position to buy uh, and lock in that monthly payment. So it says that increase in 2021 was far greater than the typical rent we've seen in recent years. In other words, rents are rising fast and the 2022 national housing forecast from realtor.com projects prices for vacant units will continue to increase this year. We expect this trend will continue to fuel rent growth at a national level. We forecast rent growth of 7.1% in the next 12 months. Um, so what this means is if you're planning to move into a different rental this year, you'll likely pay more, way more uh, than you have in the past. Um, so obviously we want to, we are, we are purveyors and promoters of home ownership. Uh, we want everyone uh, to, to buy. Uh, and not rent, but there is a place for, for renters. And so uh, you just have to empathize with them at this point. Uh, I also thought though, that because rents continue to go up year after year after year, it makes sense for more and more and more people to avoid renting and start buying. So I think this is good uh, in combination with the low interest rates that we still have, uh, record low interest rates uh, and pressure on the renters. I think it's going to fuel um, our buyer market uh, for the foreseeable future, at least the next 12 months. Um, the problem we have is we don't have, uh, we don't have a real big incentive to get sellers to sell their home other than you know, the price. Uh, but of course, if the seller wants to sell his home for a record price, he's gonna end up paying a record price for the home that he moves into. And so, uh, you know, sellers uh, seem to be the real big problem for us. We've all got more than enough buyers um, but, uh, but I think this is going to fuel the, uh, the buyers going forward for the next year. The buyers are going to want to buy, um, which is going to continue to drive, you know, our, uh, inventory levels down and our home prices up. So, which is the only weapon we have, uh, to, uh, to encourage sellers to sell is these rising prices. So. Cool. Any questions about any of that? Make sense to you? Cool. 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 So uh, I've got uh, I've got some attachments. Uh, we'll send those out to you this afternoon. 
Uh, hopefully that's helpful to you. Um, but if you do have some more questions, get in there and watch those attorneys uh, talk through some of these changes. I'm sure they can explain it better than me um, and see if that doesn't clear things up for you. So. Oh, this must be that awkward silence that Rich Fino talks about. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, all right, guys. Well, hopefully uh, we won't have too many more Zooms and we'll be able to jump back in person. I, I for one, am, am very much looking forward to that. Um, I'm really sorry we had to uh, postpone our uh, agent um, thing on Wednesday. Happy hour. Happy hour, yes. I was definitely looking forward to my uh, beer and cheese curds. So sorry that's not going to happen, but uh, we'll do it another day, another time, another place. So, all right, gang, that's it. All right. All right. Have a good one. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thank you, Jason. Bye. See ya. Bye. Thanks.